Together we have a challenge. That challenge is to bring down tobacco consumption rates in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. From their current level of about 50%, we want to halve them by 2018. And we need your help to do that. Not only in terms of educating people about the benefits of not smoking, but making sure people understand the benefits of good and healthy food and exercise. And regularly seeing their doctor. These are important messages we want you to deliver for us. And thank you for doing it. Thank you. And thanks, Minister. Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this program on reducing smoking amongst Indigenous people in Australia, funded by the Department of Health and Ageing. Smoking is the main contributor to the life expectancy gap between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and non-Indigenous Australians. Tonight we'll cover the best evidence-based strategies on prevention and smoking cessation in Aboriginal communities, particularly in the light of a new and large government social marketing campaign. You'll find a number of useful resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, rhef.com.au. Let me introduce our panel to you. Sean Apple is a Regional Tobacco Coordinator from the Tharawal Aboriginal Medical Service. Welcome, Sean. G'day, how are you going? We're going well. Sean has worked previously with the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council in New South Wales and the Sachs Institute, also in New South Wales. Rowena Ivers is a General Practitioner and Public Health Physician who's been working in Aboriginal health for about 20 years. Welcome, Rowena. Thank you. Rowena has been involved in smoking cessation programs in Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory, North Queensland and New South Wales. Tony Mason is the Aboriginal Project Coordinator at QUIT Victoria. Welcome Tony. Thank you. Tony works with the Victorian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, provides smoking cessation training and adapts QUIT resources, as you'll hear later, to make them more culturally appropriate. Jasmine Sarin is the Senior Project Officer for Tobacco Resistance and Control at the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council in Sydney. Welcome, Jasmine. Thanks, Norman. Jasmine's previous work includes the Clean Air Dreaming Project of the Illawarra Aboriginal Medical Service, and we'll hear about that later as well. Nick Zwar is Professor of General Practice in the School of Public Health and Community Medicine at the University of New South Wales. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, Norman. Nick has had a long involvement in smoking cessation and in research and practice, including contributing to the smoking cessation clinical guidelines for the Australian College of General Practitioners. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Um, I've got a, let's take a look now, at, before we get onto the panel, at the television ad that's going out from the Department of Health and Ageing. And they've produced it as part of the Break the Chain campaign to highlight the health impacts of smoking in Aboriginal communities. I watched Pop die. Lung cancer from smoking. Mum had a heart attack from her smoking. My sis and Uncle Barry have trouble breathing. Rosie next door had a stroke and doctors said it was from smokes. I was smoking for years too, but I quit. Because I don't want our kids growing up thinking disease and dying like that is normal. If I can do it, I reckon we all can. Authorised by the Australian Government, Canberra. Pretty impactful. Tony, any idea of the impact that those ads are having on Aboriginal communities? I think it's generated a lot of discussion uh, amongst the community and I think everyone's uh, excited to see that we have an Aboriginal person on the ad, so it's certainly uh, thought-provoking and uh, Whilst we haven't been able to draw data yet from our quit line, I think it's going to be fairly positive to get people thinking about changing their behaviour. It's different from uh, the non-Indigenous community ads, Jasmine, you know, which tend to sort of scare the hell out of you by showing you suppurating lungs. Uh, definitely. I don't think that the, the scare tactic uh, works as well anymore. I think people are moving away from fear-based campaigns and looking at something a bit more positive. Community and family, Sean. Definitely. Uh, I think that's where some of our biggest gains can be made by sort of uh, accessing people, getting their uh, emotions going through their, through their families. That might make them, if they can't quit for themselves, then maybe they can quit for their families. I think uh, you know, addiction is uh, a huge factor for a lot of people as to why they smoke. Um, and that's what we but need It's to kind of post hoc consider. though, isn't it? You know, that's kind of after the event. Yeah, it is a social norm for a lot of people that there is, uh, you know, encouragement to, to smoke and, and pressure to continue smoking. Those people who try to have a go at quitting uh, seem to be knocked down by others in the community and say, no, you'll, you'll go back to smoking, you know, just have another cigarette. So, you know, there's that uh, addiction, but also the social norm that, that needs to be challenged as well. Jasmine? 
Um, I think a lot of people are very aware about the health effects of smoking. I think the thing that keeps people smoking is that that idea that it relieves stress and they use it for stress management. Um, that's probably been the, the biggest um, factor. So it's not a knowledge gap. You no, go, presumably you go into any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander community in the country, ask anyone, young or old, they know that smoking is bad for them. Definitely. Right. That's not the gap. Nope. It's not a knowledge gap. No. Nope. It's an action gap. Yes. And there's all sorts of other stuff. Your take on it, Sean? Uh, I think there are some knowledge gaps. Um, like? Uh, well, I just think that there is some old health promotion information that's still out there. Like one of the big ones that I have heard about, I probably haven't seen as much, was um, there was some about smoking in during during pregnancy. So uh, there was one that said smoking gives you a smaller baby or something like that, wasn't it? Or uh, if you smoke during pregnancy, you'll have a lower birth weight baby. So I think that was kind of flipped on its head by some people and they thought, well, if I have a, a, a smaller I'll baby... I'll push it out be, more easily. This is a good thing. Right, baby, right, right. So I don't know. I just heard about that. Not the so law of unintended ago. consequences, as they say. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, so, so it's, but, but, but basically, we're talking about people nested within their communities. And Rowena, I mean, you've got a lot of experience here. We're talking about treating communities, not just individuals here, probably more so than in non-Indigenous Australia. I mean, I think the thing to really remember is that um, over the last um, 20 or 30 years, there hasn't been any um, quit smoking programs, especially for in remote areas, I mean, in, in Aboriginal services. A lot of the things that can help people quit smoking have been inaccessible and people have been un unable to afford them. And there basically haven't been any quit programs around. What's the story with socioeconomic determinants in smoking, Nick, as a determinant here? Because there's only a limit to what you can do about that, and you can sort of throw up your hands and say, "Oh, mm. let's give up." It's all about poverty, and I'm not demeaning the the, the issue here about poverty mm. and dislocation. Mm. Mm. But is that a driver? Oh, it certainly is, um, uh, and there is a, a a gradient between socioeconomic status and smoking, with people from lower socioeconomic status tending to smoke more. What's been kind of pleasing about Australia's response to the tobacco challenge is that as prevalence has gone down, it's gone down generally about the same rate in higher SES and lower SES. And I think one of our challenges, with the exception of Aboriginal people, and one of our challenges is to keep that, you know, build that equity and make it more, you know, improve on the equity and really uh, not let that divide grow uh, so that, you know, we have a, you know, a wealthy group or relatively wealthy group who are non-smokers and, and less well-off people who are smokers. Uh, but, you know, smoking is to some extent about choice, but as Rowena said, it's also about opportunity to get help to, to do something about it. Rowena, we live in a nation where in the non-traditional community, I think we have the world's lowest smoking rate, or getting pretty close to it. How does it rate for, what are the statistics for Aboriginal communities? Well, the prevalences in mainstream Australia have now been, they're now really under around 20%, um, about 17% for women and about 22% for men. Um, for Aboriginal people, it's about 50%. Um, but let's remember that in some areas around the country, it's actually about um, 70 to 80% in some parts of, um, say, East Arnhem Land. Um, uh, it's encouraging to see, and it's only a fairly recent trend between 2002 and 2008, we're starting to see a drop uh, among Aboriginal smokers and it's the first time we've seen this um, it's come down from about 50 51 percent uh, down to about 47 percent so that's really very encouraging and that means that I think the effort that health staff are making is really having an impact um, Certainly there's some, a few differences between um, urban and um, rural and remote um, prevalence for Aboriginal people, a little bit higher in, um, in rural and remote areas. Um, there's also some differences in some areas between men and women. For example, in Alice Springs, um, a lot less women um, in that area, a lot less women smoke. Um, and also some differences in the type of tobacco used. In some areas in Australia, people actually chew tobacco instead of smoking tobacco. So Tony, what are, do we know why, apart from r rurality, if I can get that out this time, and I, w w apart from rurality and remoteness, do we know what other factors determine um, a high prevalence of smoking versus a lower one in Aboriginal communities? What are the key turning points or issues? Um, I, I guess there's, we get a lot of responses when we do some training um, in the Territory and Victoria in rural areas where, you know, there's high rates of unemployment and there's a lot of boredom and a way of filling in time is, is to smoke and um, because... So it comes back to Nick's point about socioeconomic determinants. Yeah, and so you're, you're bonding and, and sharing experiences with other people through smoking. Um, 
So there's a, a whole lot of factors that come down to it, but once again, it, it's the resources in those areas um, that are key to, to helping people or encouraging people to, to change their behaviour as well. What's the contribution to the life expectancy gap? Well, um, you know, a lot of stuff coming out from the Commonwealth at the moment puts it at about 20%. Uh, it, it has to be higher than that because, you know, well, if big, you've got I mean, 50% smoking rates, then you would think that it would be the, the contribution that smoking make, makes to, to that shorter life has to be a lot higher. I, mean, I think the figures are, Nick, a pack a day at the age of 20, if you don't stop, that's 14 years off your life. Two packs yeah, a day is 19 yeah, years off. Yeah, it's around that. It varies a bit for men versus women. But yeah, and if you keep smoking past age 45, you've got a one in two chance of dying of smoking related disease. And for Aboriginal people, that would be even earlier than that. So yes, it would seem to have to be a big contribution to that gap in life expectancy would be tobacco. And Jasmine, just going back to the impact, Presumably the impact's there on children as well because you're seeing asthma and respiratory disease in children from passive smoking. Um, definitely. In the past there, there hasn't been a lot of promotion about um, you know, smoke-free cars and smoke-free homes. Um, you know, th that's been changing recently, especially in the last, um, I'd say, five years or so, um, where it's now legal to smoke in cars with children under the age of 16. Um, you know, a lot of people sort of forget that uh, environmental tobacco smoke is, is harmful to you know, growing minds and growing bodies and can actually um, you know, lead to you know young kids sort of taking up cigarette smoke and you know becoming addicted um, earlier. So the age of initiation is a key statistic here. The, the younger you start any drug, er, you know, Aboriginal or non-Indigenous, non the more likely you are to be smoking, to taking it at harmful Definitely. levels. So what's what's the age of initiation in Aboriginal communities compared to non-Indigenous? I think it's quite low. It's kind of uh, between that sort of eight to to ten age group. Um, uh, the reasons for that, I, I don't quite know in my own community. It's certainly something that, that we'll be getting around to trying to find out. But you know, partly what Jasmine's saying is you see so much around that mm. there's believed to be no controls on it. Mm. Um, w just tell me a little bit about these recent government initiatives because everybody might not be f fully aware of what's going on here. Because it's quite, I said it's you know, a government ad campaign, it's far more than that, isn't it? Yeah, so there's a, an Indigenous chronic disease package that uh, had been announced a few years ago and so there is a, a huge workforce that's going out across the country that includes uh, tobacco action workers and healthy lifestyle workers. Uh, but in addition to that there is the social marketing campaign uh, but also a quitline enhancement as well. So every jurisdiction will be working towards uh, increasing calls to the quitline from the Aboriginal community. Tell me about the social marketing campaign. Um, well, I guess social marketing is just uh, using new technologies to get health promotion out into the, into the community. So there's, there's quite a few things that are out there now. As Tony mentioned, the, the Break the Chain has just come out. Some of the other resources that are on the screen there now, some of the health promotion that different communities have developed around the different states. Um, there's also some resources there that, that help people and, and help services to develop their own health promotion and social marketing. There's videos on, on YouTube from places like Me Watch Health Centre. There's been research done. Uh, there's it's also Facebook, isn't it? Facebook, yeah. I mean, you have to fish where the uh, fish are. And there's certainly <laughs> lots of, lots of uh, Aboriginal community people are on Facebook. So why not try and uh, get the information across to them there? Facebook's almost made for Aboriginal communities, isn't it? Well, let's hope so, because uh, it's, it's definitely one of the strategies that, that we're trying to use down at, down at Thurwell, and it's been going pretty well. Like, if we post something up on Facebook, within about two or three days, we'll, we can see that you know 100 people have looked at that. If we wanted to do that the old-fashioned way by doing health promotion presentations around the community, that might take us three weeks to reach that kind of number. We've got questions and comments coming in. Peter Bowman from the Tiwi Islands asks, you can separate out two categories of smoker who should quit. Smokers who already have chronic disease and smokers who are as yet healthy. The first category is of course a priority medical problem for doctors, nurses and health dollars. But the healthy category is huge. To make any headway here requires resources far beyond what any health budget offers. And it is a social rather than a medical issue. Are there any thoughts about building workforce of health educators to tackle this with a budget coming from community resources other than medical? I suppose that's my cue to ask you what these new tobacco workers in Aboriginal communities are doing. Almost yeah. on cue. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, fantastic. Um, 
Well, we, we're trying to develop networks in our community, so with other service providers and also through our community, so other sort of important community members. So if we can sign up like this small local army of, of local champions, if you like, so people who don't smoke, those local role models, if we can find some of those and work with them to find out what it is about them that stopped them from smoking in the fir first place and then use them to work within their, their um, spheres to sort of get the information out about you know, not, not smoking. Um, we're also trying to customise a lot of the information that's already out there. So a lot of the mainstream information is quite useful information, but it's just in a format that hasn't seemed to have worked for Aboriginal people over the last 30 or 40 years since those kind of campaigns have been done. Um, we also you know, um, mobilise community resources, so hold uh, events where we can promote healthy messages as well as you know, just get people in to have a bit of a, bit of a good time. Um, and we want to try and deliver um, quit smoking support to people, whether they be individual support or in, in quit groups. And Jasmine, what are you doing about role models more explicitly? I mean, uh, in non-indigenous communities, you've largely got the benefit when you go and see a doctor, you know the doctor doesn't smoke. Yes. It's unusual. Um, whereas it's normal for an Aboriginal health worker to smoke. And they smoke at the same rate. Some people even argue a higher rate than the general community. What's being done to help support Aboriginal, Aboriginal health workers who are under a lot of stress themselves with a lot of conflicting demands in the community to stop themselves and, and if you like, lead the way? I think there's a, a little bit of research being done at the moment around looking at Aboriginal health workers and their own tobacco use. Um, the, the big issue is their own personal use being a barrier to providing brief intervention support to their clients, um, especially when the clients know that they themselves are smokers as well. Mm. So they don't want to come across as being hypocritical. Um, what we've been looking at is trying to look at ways that uh, Aboriginal health workers can feel comfortable in discussing either their own you know, tobacco use uh, with their clients. Um, we're trying to look at developing workplace practices to help Aboriginal health workers quit smoking. Um, there's a lot of incentives from some of our AMSs, whether it's, um, uh, you know, they get to leave half an hour early on a Friday because, you know, that they're not go out every five minutes for a smoker break and things like that. Um, I've also heard of some AMSs giving um, like a, a bonus if they quit, if they quit for 10 weeks or something like that, they get a, a bit of a cash bonus, which has been a really good incentive. So, Tony, uh, what about a rules-based approach? Um, I was actually Sean about this earlier as well, but a rules-based approach, because that's what's worked in non-Indigenous communities, you know, you shall not, you're just not allowed to smoke in a restaurant, you're not allowed to smoke in the workplace, this is by law, legislation, you know, we just, you, you just get tough on smokers. What about that approach in mm. terms of Aboriginal communities and workers? I think it's not, uh, it's also, it's not necessarily telling smokers that they can't smoke, but it's just uh, protecting people who don't smoke as well that might be in that space. So in particular for an Aboriginal medical service, so appeal to everyone's your altruism. going there to get healthy and right. they're walking through the smoke screen. So I think, uh, you know, we need to see much more solid um, smoke-free policies implemented into uh, some Aboriginal medical services and lots of people do have them, it's just um, communicating uh, the rules around those policies to make sure that everyone is aware uh, because we, you know the Aboriginal community is transient so you might be walking into a service that you don't necessarily know the rules and regulations and you don't want them to be told off and never come back. So. It's important about guess, communicating that. It is, yeah. I guess one of the things that we're looking at doing as well is um, working with some of the other services in our community where, where our Aboriginal community go to so that that message, that sort of policy is seemed to be community-wide. Yeah. And so they're always getting that constant message about, you know, smoking is harming health. Yeah. So try to quit. Sean, you've brought um, one of your ads along with you. Uh, talk, us, talk us into it. Talk you into it. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, this is like you know your 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 latest song, Sean. But you know, yeah. in your case, it's an ad. It is absolutely. Um, well, I guess what we're trying to do is use those new marketing technologies to get the people. Um, I think you know posters and pamphlets have been done for quite a long time and don't seem to have had any impact. Yeah. Um, so what we're trying to do is is provide health promotion in a way that's going to get the message across that people are going to look at. And you're showing this on local television? We're going to go and try and, and get it with a local community uh, television station in, in, in Sydney, yes. Let's have a look at it. Smoking has many costs to your health and your family. But have you considered how much smoking also costs you financially? 
Smoking 10 cigarettes a day adds up to almost three packets of 25 each week. That would cost around $45 each week. If you multiply that over a year, that adds up to $2,340 a year on smokes. Stop your money from going up in smoke. If you added together the financial health and family costs of your smoking, can you afford not to quit? Make an appointment today to speak to our tobacco action worker or a GP. Call 4628 That ad. Good luck with it. Yeah, thank you. Let's take a quick look at our next case study, an example of a brief intervention using the Smoke Check program. I work for ATODS, which is Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drug Services. I'm the team leader of ATODS and Mental Health here in Sherbrooke. We identified through chronic disease, through community health, that there was a big need to do something about the smoking within the community. We had some staff members go away and do training on Smoke Check uh, program and we've been delivering it here in Sherbrooke since June 2010. We do a lot of health promotion, which gets the message out uh, to the wider community. We have health days in the park um, where people can come and participate in the Smoke Check program. The Smoke Check program is very culturally appropriate. It's a brief intervention and it's certainly very, very acceptable here in the community. Hello, how can I help you? I'm here to see you, Robin, about a Smoke Check. Um, just a minute, I'll get Robin for you. Thank you. I met Linda at the health promotion day at the hall a few weeks ago. So it's really great that she's coming in now and is seriously trying to give up this time. Yeah. This first stage is um, I'm not ready to stop. I really like my smokes. So I think no, you've I'm past that stage. You're past that. I'm not sure about it if I'm ready to stop. Yeah. I'm in the, like in between unsure and then like half of me is saying I'm ready to give up. Yeah, so that... But um, I really do want to give up. So you actually... It's very decide. visual and gets to the point. People can recognise instantly where they're at with their smoking. We try and look at all the positive aspects and we always congratulate people on doing that because a lot of people take um, up to 20 times sometimes to give up before they finally give up. So hopefully it's not as long as that for Linda. Um, well, i got children, so yeah. I want to be around longer. And um, the way I smoke, I yeah. see myself um, seeing them grow. The Smoke Check program r works really well as uh, a catalyst for people to think about giving up. They often require a lot of support and assistance to do this. So, smoke this Smoke the, Check um, program is designed for Aboriginal people. I believe it is a lot better than just handing somebody um, a bit of paper because papers they don't necessarily read. Um, everybody gives pamphlets out here, so you know, they're, yeah, they're good fire starters. That's about it. Now Susie's drawing her cigarette in. We have more visual aids through the smoke check, which is something that Aboriginal people identify with. We have a lot of visual aids that we take to the schools that the children love, a bit of gooey stuff and that, so um, they love playing with it. It's more or less just to educate young kids on the harmful effects of smoking to their health, and through that hopefully the message is getting taken home. So what do you see about the good things about giving up smoking? I have more money in my yeah, pocket. certainly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they say you can save up to about 5000 a year. Yeah. So would you like to have this pamphlet. It's written for people who are ready to give up smoking. Yeah, be good. I'll read this. What are some of the things or ways that you coped then when you gave up before? I stopped smoking in my house. Yes. Um, people that come there, they don't smoke in my house anymore. Yes. What about that early morning cup of tea and the smoke? Yeah, that was the hardest yeah. part of giving up. So how did you manage that? Um, I used to drink coffee with it, so yes. now I drink tea. Okay, and do you still still sit in the same place? No. You don't? No. You sit somewhere else? Yeah. So that's a really good step because it's about habits, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So we're from here. Okay, Our so... We do this. What, what right happens on. then? Okay, so we'll have to 
perhaps we can develop a plan about when you're actually going to stop. Okay, yeah. Your stopping date and work around that plan. Okay. Yeah, and also I think it would be a good idea to have have a health check with the doctor and get the patches yeah. at the same time and that way we can monitor your health as well. Okay. So next time you come in we'll go over a plan that suits you. I do believe the program is making a difference within the community. I think um, because of all the information that we have been giving people one-on-one um, -on -one, that um, the message is sinking in to live a healthier lifestyle and uh, giving up smoking is one of those. Seems like a good program, Jasmine. Uh, yes, it does. <laughs> What's going to help someone like Linda move, um, move forward? In my experience, I think having that person that you can go to for support, um, especially if there's no support at home, having someone to sort of sit down, talk with you about, you know, how your smoking is going, um, to help you identify some of the things that you can, you can change early on. Um, yeah, it's been pretty good. I mean, Rowena, I suppose it's, it's just one person at a time here. And you, you expect that you get one person, particularly a woman, stopping smoking, she's going to guard her house and make sure that's smoke free. So it actually could have a mushroom effect. I think it's, um, it's always going to be an individual's decision to quit smoking. But I'd like to see with the programs that are going on communities, there can be community interventions as well. And I guess our role as health professionals is to help people at that individual intervention, but then to branch out into the community and be able to do other, other things as well. Tony? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's good to also talk through some strategies about how people can avoid smoking or encouraging them just to have a practice at quitting um, and just see how they go. And then and do you give them a practice about how, how to tell their husband to get out of the house <laughs> when he wants to have a fag? Yeah, it's, uh, or just keep it to the kids. It's, it's, uh, if that's easier to, to encourage people not to smoke in the home. Appeal to altruism, children. yeah. So, Nick, what's the, what are the elements of a brief intervention that we need to be aware of? Sure, well, I think we saw a lot of them in the case study. Uh, asking, uh, uh, we've got to identify and be willing to ask about tobacco This is use. the five A's that you're going Yeah, to... this is the five A's, yeah. Ask, uh, because we need to both identify smokers and document tobacco use as health professionals. And, do, and, and be prepared to ask at quite a young age too. Clearly that's very important in Aboriginal people, uh, given if they're starting smoking at age 8 to 10. Um, uh, assess, and we saw again that in the case study, we saw the assessment of their interest in quitting, the stage of change idea. And another aspect is uh, nicotine dependence. Is this person nicotine dependent and if so, to what degree? Uh, advise, making it clear as a health professional that we think that it's really important that this person uh, stop smoking and we'd like to help them to do it. Um, and then offering assistance. And again, we saw in the case study that was being tailored to that person's interest and what was right for them and might help them. Uh, and that's a lot about motivational approaches and trying to come up with a plan as a, in a partnership. Uh, and and uh, assistance often involves a medicine as well if, if a person's uh, we'll come to that in a independent. Minute. There's controversy around this, this stage of change and yeah. motivational interviewing, isn't there? There is. There is indeed uh, controversy about that. I think uh, the stage of change is quite a, an unpredictable thing. You might see someone, uh, as we saw in the case study, who's interested at that time, and you really want to kind of move forward on that if you possibly can, because something might happen, and then two weeks later, you know, then maybe there's been some problem in the family, maybe there's something else going on, and that priority has been pushed off the agenda. So the stages of change are not always predictable. People don't always move through each one in turn, uh, but it can be a useful tool and is a useful tool for a health professional to say, OK, this is how you feel about smoking at this point in time and this might be what might help you in terms of both support and, um, you know, and, 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 a, and a plan of action. What do we know about comorbidity? There's a question here from Laura from New South Wales mm. asking, do you think there's a link between smoking and alcohol use? Well, there is, uh, definitely. Uh, uh, there's higher Can rates. Can you treat one without the other? Well, that's a good question. I, I, think, I think you can treat one without the other. The, the difficulty that I think that, that people have um, with alcohol and smoking is that if they're, they're drinking, particularly if they're drinking excessively, it does trigger some of the same um, parts of the brain and, it's, it's, and also willpower tends to suffer when you've had, a, had some al uh, alcohol. 
So often people suggested to at least cut down their alcohol use if they can't abstain in a quit attempt. Rowena, Tony from the Remote Area Health Corps asks, are there any differences in smoking rates between dry and wet communities? Do we know that? Um, I'm not aware of any evidence, but again, there is a link between um, alcohol and tobacco. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that would apply. Anybody else know the answer to that question? Or just. Uh I don't actually. I, I know you hear people um, talk about... I mean, some people might argue there's a trade-off. You go dry, the smoking rates could potentially go up. I've certainly worked in remote communities that are dry that have smoking rates of 70 to 80 per cent. So, yeah. It's, Independent. Yeah. You've just got to deal with both at the same time. Do we know what people use to give up, Nick? Well, I re use a, a, a range of strategies, but the most common one is not using anything at all. And I think we've got a graphic o on that. This was some work done by the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre asking people in your last quit attempt what um, approaches did you use to help you quit and the striking thing was that 88% of people, that's that uh, blue bar on the left, hadn't used any form of support. They'd just gone so cold turkey. So they hadn't uh, gone to a, a health professional, they hadn't phoned the quit line, they hadn't used nicotine patches. Um, and so that is the most common uh, approach is to just try on your own um, and for men some people that works but certainly support and assistance can make you more likely to succeed and you know, we'd like to make that available if people would like to use it. So tell me about the pharmacological interventions. Sure. Um, okay, well, uh, again, we've got a, a slide, I think, just summarising what's available. There's nicotine replacement therapy in various forms. Of course, there's a, the patch and there's other um, shorter-acting forms like gum inhaler, sublingual tablets and lozenges. There's a medicine called bupropion sustained release and there's a medicine called Varenicline. Uh, and all of those are now available on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme uh, for both uh, Aboriginal people and for the general community. And actually, I might just uh, mm. raise a point there. For um, Aboriginal people around <coughs> Australia, um, there's a new scheme that started last year called the Close the Gap Scheme, which means that if um, Aboriginal people sign up with their um, mainstream general practitioner or Aboriginal medical service, they're actually able to access um, either free um, pharmaceutical benefit scheme medications um, or discounted um, medications if they're working and don't have a health care card. And that's made a huge contribution to the affordability of um, pharmacotherapies and I think it has made it a lot easier for Aboriginal people, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to make a quit attempt using those pharmacotherapies. Sean, you've, you feel that um, the, the message is not necessarily getting through about those, particularly to some pharmacists? Yeah, look, the last couple of times I've gone to the, the, the chemist to try and get some um, asthma medication, on the top of my script that's got CTG written there, which is what um, GPs and uh, GPs who work in AMSs have been asked to do. Uh, so you, you go along to the pharmacist, you give them that, they come back with your script and say that'll be $30 and you go, well, actually, it's part of the Close the Gap scheme and if you go to the PBS website, you can find the information. And not. So I've actually had to try and help them out there a little bit. So I don't know right. how much the information has filtered down through the systems of those pharmacists. So talk me through those various, you know, the pros and cons of those various uh, pharmaceuticals. Sure. And I think, again, we've got another uh, slide here just looking at um, the process of how you might choose which um, medicine to use. It's based really on clinical suitability and patient preference. So there's not really one medicine that stands out as being uh, that much better than the others. So, you know, the nicotine replacement therapy, uh, varenicline and bupropion all work to, to a degree and they work roughly equally well, you know. Um, uh, so really it's whether there's a, a reason to prefer one in that patient and that might be for a clinical reason, like there might be a contraindication to use one of those medicines. For example, if someone has uh, a history of recurrent depression, we don't know that varenicline is safe in those, in those people. If someone had a history of seizures, you wouldn't choose bupropion. So there's some things like that. Uh, and then there's patient preference. Some people prefer uh, something that uh, they take as a tablet, uh, and others prefer uh, the idea of using something like a patch or, you know, uh, uh, instead. So, and cost certainly comes into that as well. That's, that's definitely How a factor. Much additional help does a pharmacy, some people would argue that the additional assistance you get from either pharmacotherapy or nicotine replacement is so small as to be not worth the effort? The additional... Uh, In the, other words, okay. over just going cold turkey. Yeah, well if you took a hundred people who tried to quit cold turkey so-called today, no support, uh, either of any kind, you'd have a year later about three to five would still be quit. 
Okay, so only a small number successful, unfortunately. Um, and, but if you took a, a, that same 100 people and they made use of a medicine uh, and some support, then it might be around 20 to even 30 of those people. But it's not everybody, but it's a, certainly a big difference in, in outcome. Did you want to say something? Um, I'll, I think another factor is um, nicotine replacement therapy for pregnant women. Mm. Um, I guess that's another thing that um, it can add to the quit rate there too. We don't really want to use, um, we, I think trying to quit without any support uh, cold turkey is often advisable first, but people can use intermittent therapy like um, lozenges or um, they probably not patches, but that's also still available. And, and how much additional help from counselling, given that a lot of people will just be taking the, you know, the nicotine patches or the medication? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that uh, it's hard to disentangle. There's some evidence that nicotine replacement without counselling still has a measurable effect, a useful effect. That hasn't been proven for the other medicines because all of the studies have been along with counselling. Um, but there is evidence that uh, even without support, the medicines make a difference, or certainly nicotine replacement makes a difference. But it's a, it's a lesser difference, you know, it's not as big a, a, a benefit as if you do get some support as well. And what about um, uh, contraindications? Uh, well, there's a number, and people, of course, would need to, to look up the information about each medicine the prescribing information and there's information in some of the resources we're going to, to mention. But as I said, you know, with nicotine replacement, there aren't very many really contraindications except if you're allergic to some component of the medicine uh, or if you've just very recently had a heart attack, you'd be quite cautious about using nicotine replacement. But really, um, as I think Rowena was alluding to, it's hard to think of any example where it would be safer to keep smoking than to use nicotine replacement. I mean, it's, it's got to be better to stop smoking. Emily asks, and from New South Wales asks mm -hmm. you, Sean, in regards to the lack of knowledge being passed to pharmacists, is this a reflection of the lack of support from the government? What are they doing to help? Um, that's a really difficult one. I think, I think unless pharmacists are coming into contact with a lot of Aboriginal people, it just might not come across their, their radar. So it could be either of, of those things. So uh, I guess it's up to you know health workers and so even some of the some of the GPs who who work in areas where there aren't Aboriginal health services to to get in touch with their with their um, pharmacists to make sure that they know about this kind of um, support that the government's trying to offer. What's been the uptake of nicotine replacement since the change in the scheme, Jasmine? You know that you can now get these on PBS. Um, I think there's, there's still a lot of myths around the use of NRT. Um, I think and uh, you, you can catch it quite early if, you, if you're coupling that with counselling. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people still think that um, as soon as you put the patch on, it's going to start working straight away. Um, and there's, we've had a couple of issues with you know, using pharmacies. You know, they've, uh, clients gone down and uh, the pharmacist has refused to give them um, you know, multiple uh, NRT or combination. Uh, nicotine replacement therapies, mm -hmm. but in terms of the PBS, I don't think it's been. I don't think people have taken up as much as um, as much as they can. Mm. Yeah. And I suppose we need to set expectations here that, um, Marina, the, the, this takes a lot. Of, you know, you can take a lot of attempts before you're successful. Don't give up after the second or third time. That's right. I mean, I think most smokers um, take about six or seven attempts. I mean, in the mainstream, actually, um, it's looking, looking as time goes on as some smokers are making, you know, up to 20 attempts. Um, but some of the um, research from Aboriginal communities is that lots of people might have only made a couple of attempts. So it is about just encouraging people to try and try again and, um, and to expect that it's probably going to take a few, a few times uh, and a few attempts before they're actually successful, but to keep on being very positive and um, giving support for each of those attempts. Tell me about the college guidelines. Uh, yes, there's uh, guidelines about smoking cessation which the, um, the uh, Australian government funded back in 2004 and that's this document and available both on the RACGP website and on the uh, quitnow.gov.au website and there's, um, uh, there's those websites and as well as that there's also a, a pharmacotherapy update which the College of GPs produced uh, firstly in 2007 and has been updated a couple of times since. And this is just a, a fairly brief guide about particularly focused on the medicines uh, and, and how, how they could be used and, and where, how they fit and all the things we're talking about to do with contraindications and how you might make an assessment about which medicine to use. Summer from Finlay asks, stress, anxiety and depression make quitting more difficult. 
what we need to do about mental health to effectively tackle smoking, Rowena? Um, certainly um, among our clients with mental health problems, smoking rates are much higher. Um, I think we, uh, we tackle both at the same time and certainly I think in um, the Aboriginal Medical Service where I work, um, we would be giving them help on their psychological issues as well as help on their smoking. Jasmine? Yeah, I, I agree with Rowena. Um, I've worked with Rowena at uh, Illawarra Aboriginal Medical Service and a lot of the time, um, opportunistically mainly, I'll catch clients coming, you know, who have seen Rowena and, and we'll sort of couple up and, um, you know, case manage any other issues that they have as well. What's the nature... Of, sorry, Sean, you want to say? I was just going to say, I think we also need to um, disentangle, um, you know, nicotine cravings from, from, from stress. You know, somebody can be feeling as if they are really stressing out, but what they're actually having is they're, they're, they're craving that new shot of nicotine. So, What are the withdrawal effects of nicotine, Nick? Well, as, as uh, Sean just said, cravings, the, the, the most, um, the, that's the kind of uh, um, most common one. I mean, it's a, it's a drug withdrawal state, so people crave the drug. Um, but also people uh, often have a number of other symptoms and they might have four or more of those things you can see there. Depressed mood, insomnia. Irritability is a really common one. Irrit crankiness, irritability, frustration, difficulty concentrating, restlessness you can see and heart rate changes and appetite. Uh, it doesn't go on forever. I think that's important. Um, it, it often starts sometimes with really dependent smokers even a few hours after their last cigarette uh, and can last up to four weeks but it typically lasts about two weeks. But our aim with the medicines, of course, as, as um, people were suggesting, is to, to not have people go through that. They don't have to. We want, would like to stop that being uh, And in terms of the evidence base, what's the nature of the counselling? What do you do in counselling hmm. that works? Well, the things that seem to help, um, and it's not kind of rocket science, um, the thing that seems to help is helping people to set a quit day, um, helping people to be motivated to make a quit attempt. That's probably the main thing that health professionals do is, is encourage more quit attempts. Uh, helping people to get social support, uh, encouragement and uh, encouraging people to keep trying and feeling there's someone on their side, helping them with some problem solving things, you know, how they're going to cope with, you know, cravings, how they're going to cope if they get, um, you know, drink alcohol, how they're going to cope if they have a little lapse or a slip, how they're going to get, you know, free focus on their quit attempt. Um, and seeing people for that ongoing support as we saw in the case study where they've got someone that they can talk to, someone who's going to be um, there for them going through that process. Well being, sorry just interrupt, being on that, you know, in that situation where I've had to provide, mm. uh, you know, that type mm. of support to a client, um, mm. sort of it, setting them up for, you know, what they might experience mm. when, they, when they're going to go through their, mm. their uh, quit attempt. Um, a lot of the clients I had either hadn't made a previous quit attempt or had made um, very little um, and mostly did it cold turkey. Mm. So it was really good to sort of sit down and go, okay, you know, this is what you might be feeling and this is what you might experience. And if you do experience these things, these are what you can do, you know, mm. to help get you through that situation. Mm. Um, and instead of, uh, we had a, I had a lot of clients freak out about setting a quit date, mm. um, that it sort of, you know, made them more anxious mm. to, to do it. So we had a look at just doing small things like cue conditioning, so changing those everyday habits, um, getting them to pick out the cigarettes that were sort of crucial in their day, so that, that morning cigarette or the one after dinner, and saying, okay, when you get up in the morning, make your cup of tea or coffee, have that first, and then if you still feel like it, have your cigarette. Try not to do both of them together and try to separate those actions. Give us a sense of the resources that are available for people watching. Um, so there are a few resources out there um, already available. Um, there's the Smoke Check. Uh, we've got Smoke Check New South Wales, Smoke Check Queensland, and Smoke Check South Australia. So this is the manual you get when you uh, complete their training. Um, it does contain um, brochures on the the five steps. Uh, sorry, the the changes, stages of change. Um, also, the Talking Up Good Air Kit from Seatsy, uh, which you know has a brief. In, uh, sorry, which also deals with advocacy. Um, sort of gives you background information on... This is a Centre for Excellence in Tobacco Control you're talking yes. about. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they also have on their website uh, helpful links and, and other publications available. Um, they have a project register, so you can check out anything that might be close by in your area um, to get in contact with, so it's uh, a very good resource to have. And I think there are a few others available as well, Rowena. 
Um, certainly the other guidelines that are available in, on smoking, are, first of all the guidelines on the, uh, the preventive health check um, for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander across Australia in, includes to giving, giving advice on tobacco. Um, in Central Australia, um, Western Australia and North Queensland, a lot of uh, remote area health services also use the Central Australia Rural Practitioner um, Guidelines, the CARPA manual, which also have very clear guidelines on giving advice on smoking and how to um, advise on giving some of the pharmacotherapies as well. And don't forget the quit line, 137 848. How do you tailor the quit line in Victoria for Aboriginal communities? Uh, so really exciting uh, stuff that we're doing. It, we've employed an Aboriginal liaison officer to who will go out and start talking about uh, Quitline and demystify it for the community and, and just talk about what the service will provide for their clients. Uh, but we've also employed an Aboriginal Quitline counsellor who will specifically speak to people in our community uh, to encourage them to stop smoking and, and just have a, you know, a chat so, about So do they have a different that. script if somebody identifies as Aboriginal? Uh, I guess the, the counselling techniques would be a little bit different um, in terms of engaging with that client and building up trust and rapport. Uh, we'll also ensure that you know the, the caller will always have the same counsellor so that way they don't get to speak to someone different every time which is the current policy for mainstream callers. Tell me about that Clean Air Dreaming project that you had did in DAPTO, Jasmine. Uh, so the Clean Air Dreaming project uh, we did at um, Illawarra through Illawarra AMS. Uh, also did it at South Coast AMS um, and down at Katunga, which is in Naruma. Um, so what we tried to do is create a, a, a program that offered a wide range of support. Uh, we could also offer free nicotine replacement therapy. Um, you know, and we had the use of you know making sure our GPs knew about Verenocline and and that that was available on PBS. Um, we offered. Uh, weekly, a four-week uh, quit program that sort of looked through uh, the stages have changed. It looked through, um, you know, planning, uh, uh, having a, a, a quit plan. So how to deal with those high-risk situations. You know, if you're out with friends and you know you have a bunch of friends who only smoke while they're drinking, uh, which I find is pretty common. You know, how to deal with that situation. If you do find yourself relapsing, how to, you know, how to deal with that, and sort of re-promoting the message that you know. If you do relapse, you know, no one's going to get mad at you or putting the finger at you. Sort of get up, you know, take a few things of what you learned and try again. Um, I'm just going to ask um, for a question from Jason from Muchopper and Health Service. Do you think that plain packaging will make a difference to smoking rates in Aboriginal communities? Sean? Uh, I've been thinking about that for, for a while because it's obviously it's been in the, in the news for, for quite some time now. And... Um, I actually think it will because most of the most of the packs that we see now they're really visible. So, you know, if one of your aunties smokes or something like that, then if, if her purse is there or if she'll have the cigarettes on the on the table, you know, a bright blue or a bright red will stand out quite a lot easier than than some olive colour. So, it, I think it'll be really interesting to see what kind of impact it does have. But I think it will sort of lower that that visibility, which is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Shelley from Barwon has emailed us saying Oxygen is a great youth-specific tobacco tr control website and for resources. It is. We've had a good look at that. It's uh, more targeted towards youth, as as uh, she said. But um, there are some really interesting things on there. We've also a, a question asked uh, from Sue. Uh, what are the biggest relapse factors for Indigenous people who've quit? It's probably a crisis. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not yeah. sure how to deal with that in any other way apart from smoking. So mm. that's usually the, the contributor back to going to back. And presumably you just have to set expectations that if something like that ha happens, it doesn't mean that you've lost the plot. You can mm. always go back to quitting after that. Yeah. One cigarette does not necessarily mean the end of the world. Correct. You've got a motivational device with you, um, Jasmine. Show us it. Uh, so this is a, a PI CO smokalyzer. So what this does is measures the uh, amounts of carbon monoxide in your uh, in your lungs. So it measures it in parts per million. Um, so what happens is when you have a cigarette, you inhale carbon monoxide uh, into your system, which is created around by your red blood cells, which uh, replaces the oxygen in your body. So the more you smoke, the more carbon monoxide, the less oxygen you will have. So this is a great unbiased tool um, that we've been using and a lot of other AMSs have now uh, taken so up. So is this your bullshit monitor, is it? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it works pretty well. Um, and you can use it with, um, with youth as well. Um, so it'll give a reading and it sort of 
you know, we'll, we'll place you somewhere on a chart whether you're a non-smoker, a light smoker, uh, an addicted smoker and a heavily addicted smoker. So it comes in quite handy. Keith from Cairns asks, I'm a physiotherapist working in Cairns to assist with cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation. Where can I ask the quit, access the quit smoking literature specific to Indigenous clients? Tony? Uh, there's lots of literature around. I think, uh, you know, the Centre for Excellence in Indigenous Tobacco Control has a lot of... So it's, the, it's those resources there. that Jasmine gave us earlier. Yeah, and then there's also Tobacco in Australia Facts and Issues, which is quite comprehensive and has a lot of information. Right. Um, a uh, question from South Australia, Tony, what are the harmful components of smoking? Uh, all the chemicals that are in Everything. tobacco, yeah. There's, there's not much that's good. No, uh, there's over 4,000 compounds that are, you know, poisonous and 69 of them are, are known to cause cancer. So it's um, quite scary that it, and that's in each cigarette, not per packet either. So. Um, there's lots of health effects. Another question from Summer from Finlay asks, um, you know, the Close of the Gap campaign seems to be focused on individuals and families rather than broad socioeconomic determinants. And she's asking, you know, how do you get the balance there? Does there need to be more done at a policy level? Uh, the Close the Gap campaign also has funding for other um, broader factors that improve, um, in, improve those socioeconomic factors. So it's also got funding for education programs in terms of closing the gap there um, and in terms of ho housing funding. There's a wide range of programs. I guess on the tobacco programs, again, it's programs like Sean's. It's the broader community um, tobacco programs, not just based on a one-on-one -on -one basis in the clinic. Quickly move to a case study. Ruby's 26. She comes to see you, Rowena, at the local Aboriginal Medical Service with two small kids. She's concerned about their health. The youngest, Jimmy, is three years old. He's got a discharge from his ear. Becky, who's five, has a cough and a runny nose. And Ruby smokes 20 a day. What are you going to do? This is a very familiar scenario. In fact, I've been in the clinic today and we probably had that, this scenario a few times over the last <coughs> couple of days. Look, in an Aboriginal medical service, it's really a team approach. So um, a lot of the work is spread between um, Aboriginal health workers, child and maternal health workers, um, nursing staff and GP. So um, certainly we'd be seeing the kids. Um, we'd be looking at their ear problems and um, respiratory tract infections, but probably also doing a um, child health check at the same time. Now a routine part of our child health check, um, and in fact a routine part when people, when children present with um, illnesses that we know are probably related to exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, mm -hmm. is to ask about tobacco. And so, um, and it's about addressing whether um, family members are smoking around them and addressing um, the role of parents as role models themselves. So we might then sit down with um, Ruby and, um, and go through a health check with her. So again, it comes back to the five A's. We want to first ask her whether she's a smoker and record on her medical records so people in the future can check on how she's going. We want to advise her strongly to quit and link it to her children's illness because this is a time when she's going to be um, responsive to that kind of advice. Um, we want to see whether she's ready to quit, assess whether she's ready, ready to quit, and it might mean using some of those pamphlets we've choosed, um, shown tonight. And then we want to assist her in quitting. So so again, it might mean um, signing up for Close the Gap and possibly um, certainly giving a brief intervention, possibly using some pharmacotherapies and arrange follow-up with either the um, smoking worker or Aboriginal health worker um, or a GP or nurse. So, Sean, just finally, people are all fired up at the moment. There's a lot of money going into this. It looks as if for once we're going to have targeted campaigns to Aboriginal people, which might make a difference. Uh, 200 people, I think, coming, you know, working in your area and tobacco control around the country. How to maintain the fire? Uh, well, I think um, we've already seen smoking rates coming down, so I, I think that movement is, is happening. I think there are a lot of so you people see, you see who the are smoking. So you, the, the feedback to workers, the, the benefits of their work is going to be the, one of the things to maintain the energy? Well, yes, but I, I think um, some of our workers could be doing more as well. So. You know, I, I hear quite a lot that um, health workers, and I don't want to demonise health workers, they do a fantastic job, but, you know, one of the things we hear is that they don't, they don't feel comfortable talking to uh, community members who smoke about their smoking if they also smoke, so they don't want to make hypocrites of, of themselves. And I would say to those health workers, look, it, it is our role as health workers, armed with the information about what tobacco does, to pass that information on to the community members so they can make their own choices. Um, that's definitely one area where I think we can have a, a big gain in the next few years.
Uh, a couple of quick comments from um, our viewers. Um, Nicola from Victoria asks or comments that um, you know, general practitioners and others need to be aware of their Aboriginal patients and specifically target. Um, I mean, I presume there's no barrier to asking, uh, you know, being able to identify people or self-identifying people in the, in the community so that you know who's Aboriginal in your patient group? It's actually um, a, an accreditation requirement for mainstream general practice to actually ask um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander status for everyone across Australia when they're entering health services. And one of the messages from tonight's program is target the message. Um, and uh, be careful of that. The uh, Maria from Forbes wonders, have rural councils been proactive in promoting smoking cessation? And it will be highly variable, Sean. Some awesome. have, actually. I think Cobar, um, their main street is, is, is smoke-free. So uh, I think some councils have been quite proactive. Um, some, of the, some of the urban councils probably could learn from some of the rural councils. So what are your take-home messages, Nick? Well, I think it's uh, identify smokers and offer support. Try to offer that support to, for the things we know help. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, not everyone will want it, and that's completely there. We respect that, but we would like to offer it and, uh, and to try to have a partnership to help uh, address the issue. Jasmine. Um, Tobacco has been a big issue for a long time, and it's, I think it's good to finally see the spotlight on it. Um, so, you know, feel free to, to seek support or to offer advice if you're in those positions. Tony. I think a health professional should be um, not afraid to ask their cl Aboriginal clients about their smoking status and certainly encouraging them to move through the stages of change and, and help them plan a quit attempt. I would say that it's important for all health professionals, health workers, nurses um, and, and GPs to keep giving advice. It is making, it is making a dent in the smoking rates and um, yeah, I guess as Warren Snowden said, we want to bring the smoking rates down by 50% um, over the next um, seven or eight years. And presumably there will be a threshold, you get to a certain point and it will speed up, like it did in the non-Aboriginal community. Sean? Um, look, I would just uh, urge if there are any health workers listening just to try and support the people who are trying to make a quit attempt, just to try and raise their, their confidence so that they'll just keep trying and trying and trying until it actually sticks. Thank you all very much indeed. It's been great. And we'd like to thank the Centre for Excellence in Indigenous Tobacco Control, Smoke Check New South Wales and Smoke Check Queensland for providing information and resources. We'd like to thank the Department of Health and Ageing for making the program possible and of course our panel members. But also thanks to you for taking the time to attend and contribute. Now you've got to tell us what you thought about the program by filling in an evaluation form. And as always, if you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised in the program, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website. That's rhef.com.au. I'm Norman Swan. I'll see you next time.